Welcome everybody to Friday Q&A, a webinar series produced by the UF Thompson Earth Systems Institute Scientists in Every Florida School Program and the Community Scholars Initiative. Each Friday at 3 p.m. for 30 minutes, a scientist will present on their area of expertise, followed by a question and answer session. The Scientist in Every Florida School Program is a free program housed within the Thompson Earth Systems Institute at the University of Florida. The CEPS program connects and builds long-term partnerships between teachers and scientists in order to bring current scientific research and big data into classrooms in Florida and beyond. The Community Scholars Initiative is based at Valencia College in Orlando, Florida. Our goal is to connect, create, and elevate educational experiences in the classroom and our community. Supported by the Lake Nona community, we facilitate programs in both Orange and Osceola County schools and work with community leaders and businesses to build out of school learning programs. During the COVID-19 school closures, we are happy to partner with CEFs to continue engaging with our students, teachers, and parents in a digital platform. Today, we are joined by Samara Nehemiah, and she is a current master's student at the University of Florida in the Fisheries and Aquatic Sciences program. She is based out of the UF IFAS Nature Coast Biological Station in Cedar Key, Florida, where her current research focuses on the impact of environmental factors on spotted sea trout recruitment. Samara is originally from Maryland and obtained her bachelor's degree in environmental science and policy from the University of Maryland in 2015. She worked as an intern and research assistant with the Florida Program for Shark Research, as well as the Creel Clerk and intern with the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission before starting graduate school. Samara is uh, set to obtain her MS degree from the University of Florida this August and plans to continue in the field of fisheries biology. So as Samara tells you about her work, please add your questions into the chat and one of our moderators will ask the questions for you. And with that, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you and good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Um, so I first kind of just wanted to talk to you about our field um, of fisheries biology, and then I'll kind of go into my research and what I do every day. Um, so a fisheries biologists are just scientists that manage and study fish and their habitats. Um, but this is can consist of a lot of different topics. Um, so fisheries biologists could study freshwater fishes, so fish in your rivers and your lakes and your streams, um, or they can study saltwater fish, so um, fishes in your oceans or in estuaries. Um, and they can also do a lot of work um, on a lot of different topics. So we have fisheries biologists that study invasive species, um, fisheries biologists that study predator-prey interactions and how fish play into their food webs and their environment. Um, I am in the field of management within fisheries biology. So if you ever have gone fishing, um, there's usually a limit on how many fish you can catch um, and what size they can be. And so we do research on um, the dynamics between human interactions and what they want to be able to keep, um, as well as the natural population. So we kind of are a balance between the two. Um, and so as a fisheries biologist, um, I've been able to do a lot of different types of work in the field. Um, I'm lucky in that I get to spend a lot of time outside. And so I've gone, um, I've done a lot of trips um, in the estuaries and sampled some of our community fishes out there. Um, in the middle picture, you can see we're pulling a really large net. This is what's the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. Um, and we're sampling some of the fish species in Cedar Key. Um, I've also gone offshore. So I've been on a boat for a couple of days, also with FWC um, and targeted some fish off reefs. Um, and the first picture you can see Doing, me doing a fish dissection. That's a lot of what I do actually um, is working with fish. We can get a lot of good information um, from fish um, dissections such as um, stomach content and what fish eat, um, what sex they are, how old they are and things like that. Um, I also do a lot of lab work um, and so I'll get into that in the next slide but I spend a lot of time inside processing some samples from fish um, and other things and then you can also be a fisheries biologist that stays inside and does a lot of modeling work. We have some scientists and grad students in our lab that model complex um, food webs. And so they rely on data that other scientists collect and they build these complicated models um, in a program software. 
um, and that, that's to project forward in time. So no matter what you're interested in, um, there's something for you in this field. Um, I'm actually someone who, though I like being on the water, I can also get seasick. And so if you are someone that gets seasick and you, you don't have to go on a boat, um, there's other things you can do on shore um, in this field as well. So um, as a graduate student, I have my own research project, but I also get to help with a lot of other projects. Um, but for my studies, uh, I study spotted sea trout, which is this speckled fish uh, pictured on the left here. Um, spotted sea trout are found throughout Florida, throughout the Gulf of Mexico, and up through New York. Um, and they are important sport fish, so people like to catch them um, for meat to eat or just for fun. Um, and they're also an important fish for estuaries. So estuaries are environments where um, rivers meet the ocean. So they create these kind of complicated um, fresh and saltwater mixes. Um, and they spotted sea trout spend their whole life in these areas. And so they're important for shaping um, food webs and dynamics in these areas. Um, spotted sea trout are not a trout at all. They're in the drum family. And drums get their names because they create um, this drumming or croaking sound in the spawning season. So males will form these large groups um, and start creating these sounds to attract mates and to sync up spawning events. Um, and so for my research, we are interested in learning different dynamics um, at the juvenile scale. So um, every year with fish, you can have good year classes, classes, which means there were either a lot of juveniles that survived and made it into the adult population, or you can have bad year classes where a lot of juveniles didn't survive. Um, and we kind of want to under, better understand those dynamics and what is causing good year classes and what's causing bad year classes because that's our best indicator of what the adult population will look like um, a few years down the road. And so in order to do this, um, we take a snapshot of the current adult population and look backwards in time. So in order to do this, we need to age some of our spotted sea trout and we do this by looking at their fish's ear bones. So bony fish have ear bones like we do um, that are called otolith, which transfer, translates to ear stones. And so on the picture of the left, you can see me pulling out an otolith from a spotted sea trout. And we can actually use these structures to age the fish because um, these bones grow with the fish and fish um, grow much faster in the summer when the water is warm and they have a lot of food than they do in the winter when they don't have a lot of food. And so in the winter, they get these dense opaque rings like tree rings, if you've ever seen a picture of tree rings and they look like this. Um, so this is a small section of an otolith that is um, zoomed in under a microscope. And if you see this V section here, that is their, what we call their core. So at the point of the V, their core, that is where the fish was born. Um, and then that white space is its growth in its first few months of life. And then that dark brown ring is when it would have been laid in the winter when it stopped growing, it gets that brown ring, like a tree ring. Um, and that looks like, the, like this, you can see its growth. And then it has another brown ring um, later on. So at the time that this fish was captured, it was about two years old um, and a few months older than that. You can see there's a little bit more growth after that ring. And so we get a lot of ages from numerous spotted sea trout, and this can be for any species as well, but for my study, it's for spotted sea trout. And once we compile a lot of our ages, um, we can then look at trends in abundance for those age, ages. So. For most fish, we want to see if how many older fish are in the population and um, or how many, what years were good and what years were bad. So if there's a high year, there's a lot of two-year-olds in the population, then maybe two years ago, 2018, there were favorable conditions, um, environmental factors, maybe there were a lot of prey resources that pushed a lot of juveniles through the system. Um, and this is important mostly because for spotted sea trout, you can see from these pictures, um, they're really popular to fish for, as I mentioned before. Um, you can target them from shore, from a boat. They're relatively easy to catch and they're very tasty. So they're one of the most popular sport fish in the state of Florida. 
Um, and so we need to be able to understand their population dynamics in order to better manage their population and make sure that we're not overfishing this species. Um, so we want people to be able to fish for them in the capacity that they want, but we also want to make sure that there's enough fish left to thrive and reproduce and exist for many generations. Um, and so we just want a sustainable fishery. Um, but this is true of a lot of other sport fish. So in Florida, if you've ever fished for a largemouth bass or redfish, um, catfish, these are all populations that are managed. And we want to better understand these populations and make sure that we are doing enough by them so that they're around for a long time. <clears throat> um, and so, so for my study, um, we just hope that the information we gather from it will help us um, better manage it. So um, that kind of wraps up my research. But as I said, I've also been able to help with a lot of other projects as a graduate student and um, as a biologist. So we've worked on tagging studies. We've done a lot of work with snook um, that are a new species in Cedar Key. So they com commonly are found in South Florida. And as the waters have warmed and climate the climate has been changing. They've actually found their way north of South Florida into Northern Florida. Um, and though they're not an invasive species or anything, we don't really know how they'll, they are going to fit into um, our ecosystem in Cedar Key. And so we are doing a lot of tagging studies um, to see how they're utilizing rivers in this area and things like that. So there's a lot of different things you can do um, as a fisheries biologist in this area. So this was just a quick, um, overview of some of the work I do as a graduate student. Samara, thank you so much. I love learning more about the type of fish research that's being done. Between Zoom, as well as our live stream, we have a ton of questions. So I'm excited to jump right into them with you. Our first question comes from Langna, who asks, what type of fish do you study? So I study sized sea trout. Um, that's the fish in this picture here. Um, so they're related to redfish and mackerel, um, but they're pretty common in Cedar Key. Um, that's for my research, and that's the fish that I study mostly. Nikita is curious, what tools do you use during a fish dissection? Good question. So fish dissections can get a little bit messy, um, but most of the time you just need a knife or a scalpel or something like that that allows you to cut through the fish. Um, some people don't like fish dissections, but I think they're really fascinating because um, although usually we have to sacrifice the fish and mean the fish is no longer with us, we can get a lot of good biological information that we can't get from the fish um, when it's alive. And so as I showed you, we can get the ages from them, we can get um, information about what they're eating and maybe um, if they have any parasites and things like that. So. In order to do a dissection, we really just need a knife, sometimes some tweezers to be able to pick things out, um, but you don't really need a lot. Our next question comes from Becca, who asks, what first got you interested in studying fish? How did you develop a passion for it? That's a good question, kind of a long answer. So um, I'm from Maryland, so I'm from right outside Washington, D.C. I didn't grow up fishing. I didn't really grow up outside, but when I got to college, I was really fascinated with wildlife in general. Um, so both um, marine organisms, freshwater organisms and terrestrial species and the species on land. Um, and so I just kind of wanted to try it out. I didn't really know what I wanted to do when I got to college and I think that's okay. But so I took a couple classes at Maryland um, and I ended up moving to Florida right after I graduated because Maryland um, doesn't have a lot of fisheries classes, so I didn't really get a ton of that experience, but I just wanted to try it out. But I was mostly interested in management, so I am really interested with the human interaction with wildlife, and I think it's important that we balance the two and not favor one over the other. So that kind of got me interested in fisheries in general, and then once I was able to get on the water every day, I just um, fell in love with it. So I don't have like a typical story, but I definitely was interested in it um, once I got to college. Our next question comes from Rachel who asks, do you fish for fun or only for your research? 
So I'm lucky and I do get to fish a lot for my research, but I do also fish for fun when I can. Um, it's, I'm very busy and so I spend a lot of time outside. So sometimes on the weekends, I don't wanna fish all the time, but I do get to fish for fun. Um, occasionally we have a lot of lakes and rivers or in Florida that you can fish from really easily. So um, I try to do as much as I can. Caleb is curious, are there endangered fish within Florida's waters? That is a good question. So there are a lot of fish that are either overfished or um, declining, not most fish. So most fish are pretty well managed. Um, so I'm trying to think of uh, fishes in Florida, but if you think of like sturgeon are fish that are pretty rare now, um, actually spotted sea trout and redfish, so they're popular fish um, historically, like many decades ago, were overfished and on the brink of extinction, but due to good management and new regulations, they were able to come back. So um, there's a lot of fish that have kind of gone up and down. We also have some invasive fish here, um, such as lionfish in saltwater. Um, they're pretty, um, pretty prevalent in our oceans. And then freshwater, we have some catfish, um, armored catfish and walking catfish that can cause some damage as well. So um, there's interesting dynamics here, mostly due to overfishing, but hopefully with good management, we'll be able to keep them around. Our next one comes from Gayathra, who's tuning in today from Sri Lanka. She says, I'm studying about the age of a marine ray similar to your project. And she's wondering if possible, it, will your thesis be published and uh, accessible to others? Yes, so I am planning to graduate this August and hopefully um, my thesis will definitely be published through the University of Florida Libraries. Um, and hopefully I can get a couple of my chapters published um, through some scientific journals as well. Um, so just keep an eye out for that in the coming months. Stephanie says, I'm so curious as to why they are called sea trout if they're in the drum family. Why are they called sea trout instead of speckled drum? That is a good question. A lot of, so um, sea trout is their common name and they can have, spotted sea trout have a whole wide variety of common names. Um, and so, Sea trout, I think, comes from the fact that they kind of resemble a trout. So if you think of trout in your lakes, um, rainbow trout or brown trout, they kind of look similar, um, but their scientific name, Cynosian nebulosus, is what kind of ties them to the drum family. So the common name is more, are usually given to um, how a fish looks rather than what they actually are. Penelope asks, do you ever use fossilized otoliths from fish for your research? That's a good question. I don't. Um, I usually just get them from fresh fish. And actually, I should note it how we get a lot of our fish. So we work with a lot of charter captains in Cedar Key. And so they take clients out and go fishing. Um, and they give meat from the fish to their clients. And then the rest of the fish is usually just thrown away. And we actually take those fish and get a lot of good information from them um, before they're just thrown out. Um, so my fish come from what's actually in the population. So we can get a real time es uh, estimate of the dynamics of the current population. Um, there are some people that do some otolith chemistry and, and um, things that are a little bit above my head. <laughs> Um, but, um, so for your answer, no, I only use current fish. Diana asks, are there any diseases or viruses that impact fish similar to the way COVID impacts humans? Um, that's a good question. So fish do have a lot of internal parasites and worms. Um, similar, we can get the same and your pets can get the same. Um, they can be susceptible to harmful algal blooms, such as red tide events, as if you're familiar with um, what was going on in South Florida. Um, last year, we had a pretty bad red tide event, um, which can kind of poison the fish and kill them. Um, to diseases, they don't have like the flu or colds or similar things like that, um, but they are susceptible to <clears throat> some other parasites um, internal and external that can cause some harm. 
Marlo is curious, did you work with Mike Allen on the Snook study at all? If so, how did it compare to your spotted sea trout research? Yeah, so Dr. Allen is my graduate advisor. Um, he's the best. Um, so I helped him out and FWC, the Snook FWC, and they have a lot more projects with Snook because we want to understand kind of what's going on. Um, we, for Snook, um, a lot of what we were trying to do is to follow their everyday um, movements. So we put, actually, you can consider it a dissection, but um, scientists with FWC and our scientists at UF actually inserted um, a small tag internally into the snook. So they kind of make an incision on their bellies, put a tag in, and then stitch them back up. And we put them back in the water, and we have all these receivers that pick up um, information from that tag so we can track where in the river the snook were moving. So it's different than what my sea trout project is doing, um, but has similar implications in that um, snook can cause, I don't want to say harm, but they can create a feed on spotted sea trout. Um, so they can compete with spotted sea trout, they can compete with redfish, um, and so what we're doing with the snook is to just better manage again the species, but also see how they're impacting other species to see if we have to um, manage those species differently as well. So it's, they're different, but they're all kind of related in the end. Henry asks, what is the relationship between fish, um, fishery scientists and commercial fishermen? Um, that's a good question. So commercial fishermen, um, typically go out and catch fish for um, our restaurants, for our markets, or um, for sea the seafood industry. So they are catching meat that we then consume. Um, what fisheries biologists, um, though sometimes we also need to catch fish, and sometimes we work closely with um, commercial fishermen. Sometimes they help us catch our fish that we need in the case of my study, we work with some of our local captains here to get some of our samples. Um, but at the same time, fisheries biologists sometimes also are trying to regulate um, whether they're allowing commercial fishermen to catch more fish or trying to restrict some of the fish that um, commercial fishermen can do. Um, so our work definitely has an impact on them. Um, we just in general, want to make sure, at least the work that I do, um, as I said before, that fish are allowed to be caught and harvested by humans and by commercial fishermen, but we also want to make sure that they are naturally abundant and that they can exist for many, many years to come. Um, and so we try to not put too many restrictions on the fishing industry, but at the same time, we also want to make sure that they're not going to um, wipe completely wipe out our fish population. So, um, in the there, if you're familiar with cod at all, um, cod was a fish that biologists thought were doing okay, um, and commercial fishermen were catching a lot of them. But what happens is we almost wipe them out completely. We harvested. We harvest means we um, kit, like take for consumption. Um, we harvested too many of them, and so. Fisheries biologists basically want to make sure that that doesn't happen. So we want to kind of balance the two. So we work closely with commercial fishermen um, for a lot of different um, reasons. Nikita is curious if fish sneeze. What did you say? I missed the question. <laughs> Nikita is curious if fish sneeze. Oh, um, I don't think fish sneeze. Um, but fish do a lot of other cool things that we do. They, as I spot sea trout, they make noises, they can communicate with each other. Um, they have a lot of funny adaption, adaptations that kind of resemble some human characteristics sometimes, but they don't really seem. Abby is wondering, is it true that many fish species are captured with pieces of plastic and heavy metals in them? If so, what can we do to help? That is a good question. So increasingly, we've been seeing um, recently more fish um, and marine mammals um, and sharks and, and things that have plastic in their, 
bellies um, and sea turtles as well. Um, and so um, some of them are microplastic, so they're kind of really small and maybe if we're looking for other things, we might not catch it, but definitely um, we're starting to see a lot more fish, not just in Florida, but kind of all over the world that have more plastic in their bellies. Um, I'm actually trying, I'm very passionate about plastic because um, it takes a long time to rid itself. It's here for, for hundreds of years. And so what you can do um, is you can reduce your plastic use. You can recycle what you can. Um, you can also make sure things end up in the trash can. Um, you can skip a straw. Instead of using a plastic straw, you can use paper straw if that's something that's easy. Whatever you can do that um, you can do. Like you don't have to do everything. You don't have to completely rid your life of plastic. Um, but every little thing helps. So if, if you can only use paper bags instead of plastic bags and do that. Um, so hopefully over time, we'll start to see less plastic in our waterways um, and find better ways to recycle the plastic we have. But until then, just, just be mindful of your use. All right, Samra, we have time for just one or two more questions. Our next one comes from Gabriel who asks, what can, what can recreational fishing fans do to help fisheries? That is a good question. Um, so the most important thing you can do is to follow all the rules and regulations that are in place for whatever you're trying to fish for, which sounds simple, but these are always changing. Um, they're different for different regions, might have different regulations on the same fish, um, and they're different across states. Um, and so before you go fishing, you should check um, online, check with FEC. Um, you can have an app on your phone or sometimes um, at the the boat ramps, they'll have um, posters of the regulations and just make sure you know what the sizes are for fish that you can catch and um, how many you can keep. So you're following all the rules. The rules are in place to be sustainable. So if you're following the rules, you're not doing anything wrong. Um, and at the same time, um, you can properly discard of your fishing line um, and make sure you report any bad behavior. If you see someone keeping fish that are too small, or people doing things that they shouldn't. Um, you can report that to FWC to make sure that everyone's um, following the rules. And our final question comes from Liam who asks, can people visit aquaculture farms to tour them? That's a good question. Yeah, um, usually you can. It depends on the facilities. Um, so UF has a couple ponds and tanks that they um, use and usually you can go and see them, um, but it depends on the facility. At some point, um, my lab, the Nature Coast Biological Station, will um, have more tanks set up that when we have visitors, we usually show them around, but each lab is different. So it's important probably just to call ahead before you go somewhere to make sure. Awesome, Samra, do you have any final thoughts you would like to leave our attendees with today? Um, I just wanted to say, well, thanks to everyone for listening. Um, and something that I take home, take very seriously, and it's helped me through my career so far is if you're interested in something, um, don't be afraid to just try it out. It, it can never hurt to volunteer somewhere or reach out to somebody if you're curious. Um, biologists, we come in all shapes, sizes, and colors, and so you shouldn't be discouraged to try anything that you might find interesting to you. Excellent. Thank you again so much. At this point, we'll hand things over to Stephanie. Thank you, Brian. Thanks everyone for joining us on today's call to learn a lot more about fish. And a very special thanks to Samara for taking the time to speak with us today. Uh, once again, our Friday Q&A events take place weekly at 3 p.m. Eastern uh, Daily Time um, as part of the collaboration between scientists in every Florida school and the Community Scholars Initiative. You can learn more about everybody uh, you have seen here on this program today by visiting the sites on your screen. And you can also find a recording of today's program on our YouTube channel, along with a lot of great resources we've created for you in reference to fisheries. If you'd like to uh, learn more again, please visit Scientists in Every Florida Schools website. Be sure to register for next Friday's Q&A when we'll learn more about dolphins. Thanks so much and have a great special holiday weekend. Bye-bye.